Welcome, everyone. I'm sad and excited at the same time. Sad that our day together is coming to an end, but very excited to uh, lead the last panel uh, of our conference. Um, our panel is about gender neutral instruction and some amazing initiatives that our presenters have put together. And I want to be very mindful of the limited amount of time that we have. Um, so I want to get started right away um, introducing our presenters and reminding you that any questions that you have for the presenters uh, will be addressed at the end. Uh, so please feel free to uh, add those questions to the chat, um, message me directly, put them in the chat, and then I will direct them uh, to our uh, presenters at the end. Uh, presenters, um, I'm going to give you 15 minutes. I know it's limited, but given how rich the discussions at the end have been, I want to make sure that we honor the time for our audience and that uh, we give them an opportunity to engage with you all. Um, so let me introduce you our first uh, presenter. His name is Ben Papadopoulos and uh, Ben is a, a doctoral candidate uh, in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Berkeley. Um, he's also a graduate student instructor of linguistic, uh, gender and women's studies and Hispanic linguistics. Ben is a social cultural linguist focusing on features of gender in different language. Uh, and he's the founder and editor of the Gender in Language project uh, that he will be presenting on uh, for our first um, talk. For our second talk uh, uh, about a grammar book that includes non-binary Spanish, I have my three dear colleagues here from USC. I have Maria Mercedes Fajes Agudo, um, that is a professor at USC uh, since 2010. Uh, Mercedes directs Feliz en la Comunidad, which is a service learning program that allows students to practice their Spanish teaching and also leadership skills um, in the community. Uh, Mercedes was also awarded the USC Dornside Faculty Council Service Award and the JAP Award for Community Engaged Teaching. Uh, and in 2022, together with other two colleagues, she launched uh, OER in Spanish, a searchable site for Spanish instructors and students. Um, Liana Stepanian, uh, you know her all already, uh, but she's an associate professor. She's also the coordinator of Spanish 3. Uh, she has been teaching at USC since 20, uh, since 2007. She established USC Spanish and Portuguese Achievement Award and also created Lingua Franca, which is an experimental community outreach program. Um, in 2018, uh, she also launched the uh, digital OER journal in Spanish named Revista Sede, um, and she focuses on second language acquisition, non-binary language, and the inclusion of primary sources in undergraduate courses. Um, Goretti Prieto Botana is the director of the Spanish language program here at USC. Um, she got her PhD in second language acquisition in Maryland. Um, Goretti has taught language courses all level, as well as um, linguistic, uh, play linguistic courses. Um, and she's currently in charge of the language teaching methodology uh, for grad students um, here in our department. Her research interests include grammar-related learning learnability issues, explicit forms of instruction, and also task essentialness. And last but not least, our last presenter is Eduardo Viana da Silva, an associate teaching professor and coordinator of the Portuguese program at the University of Washington, Seattle. Um, Eduardo uh, received his PhD in Luso Brazilian literature with an emphasis in applied linguistic uh, from UC Santa Barbara. And he also has an interdisciplinary degree in teaching uh, from UC Santa Barbara. His research focuses on applied linguistics, virtual exchanges, and Brazilian literature. And uh, with that last piece of information, I would like to. Um, give the opportunity to Ben to get us started on this. Thank you so much. Do you see me in full screen over here? Yes, thank you so much, Carolina, our session chair. I also really want to say thank you to Liana and Evgeny for organizing this conference. I feel like we've been talking about it for the better part of a year, and it's really cool and rewarding to see it come to life as fantastically as you all had hoped. 
congratulations and thank you so much for my own invitation. I feel so honored to be here and to share my work. Um, like the last panel, I also would like to say to you all, if you didn't hear that because I muted myself, happy Trans Day of Visibility. We're giving ourselves a refresh today, hence the flags. Um, my name is Ben Papadopoulos. I use he pronouns, they pronouns, any kind of pronouns are all right. Um, I am a PhD candidate. I just passed my quals last week. This is the first time I get to use that title. I feel so cool about that. Thank you so much. It was so hard. <laughs> As you heard, I am a sociolinguist. I'm also a critical sociologist with training uh, emphasis, emphasis in decolonial theory above all, which has so much to do with what I will talk about today. Um, I'm also a graduate student instructor at Berkeley. I've taught four semesters of Spanish in my time, all elementary, but levels one and two, as they are coded at my institution. And this year, I've had the honor of uh, teaching gender and women's studies and now Spanish linguistics, where I get to deal with the intricacies of gender in Spanish with my students, and it's been awesome. Uh, so I would like to also talk about a project that I've created at Berkeley that's called the Gender and Language Project. And to give you a sense of what it is, it is a freely available public website that offers a complete description of gender in the grammar and lexicon of as many languages as we can possibly research. So if you would like in the background of me speaking to go to genderinlanguage.com and have a browse, have a surf, you are very welcome to do so. I invite you to. Uh, this is an example of one of our resources for Spanish. This is a grammar of gender in Spanish. So as we know, the Spanish language has gender in almost all parts of its grammar except for verbs. And so what we are trying to do with these resources is to show the, the traditional masculines and feminines, as well as any neutral forms that exist in these languages. That is simpler for a language like English than it is for Spanish, in which everything must be marked masculine or feminine. So here what we have done in the third column is to show all of the inclusive gender that's going on. These are proposals. Um, in Spanish, it's beyond proposals. These are systems that are being used, and we have collected many attestations of these to compile a picture of inclusive gender across the entire language. And a little bit later, I will be able to speak to you all about how we construct these documents, which I'm so excited to do. Um, and so our project in this way is very much focused on non-binary people, trans people, gender non-conforming people, anyone looking for a neutral option, and we intend to communicate the knowledge that we make to all of these communities in different venues. Um, these are the languages that we currently have documents for, so Catalan, Danish, English, uh, Irish, Italian, Mandarin Chinese, Portuguese, Spanish, and Tagalog. Now we've been at work all year long and we're going to soon have some more languages to launch in May. Um, and I'm super excited about these. So there is a subset of indigenous languages of Latin America that we have worked on. So Aymara, Nahuatl, Yaqui, and Yucatec Maya, and also languages with gender on verbs, uh, in addition to other grammatical uh, categories. So Arabic with focus on the Levantine dialect, Hebrew, and Hindi. So I'm super excited to talk to Tal <laughs> and some others of you today. Thank you so much for sharing your research. Okay, so I wanted to give a sense of the history of this project, how it ties into my identity, uh, my research, etc. So I actually did my undergraduate at Berkeley as well, and I have since returned to do my doctorate at the same institution. And Berkeley is situated in the California Bay Area, the so-called queer capital of the world, and I have been so lucky as well as to be a queer person myself to meet all kinds of people, and many of my friends in my undergraduate um, and are still my friends, are Spanish speakers, many of them trans and non-binary themselves. And at the time that I began to think about research in my undergrad, um, were transitioning or changing their own self-identification. And then they asked me, you know, I really would like to speak about myself to my friends in Spanish or to my parents in Spanish, but I just have no way of doing so because there's so much masculine and feminine in this language that leaves behind no neutral options. So they asked me, could you research this? Could you as a linguist let us know what's going on? And I'm so glad they asked me the question because it was the first time that I ever figured out what my true research interests were in the language and gender subfield, which I had never seen in all of my formal training in linguistics. So I wrote a senior thesis. I did empirical research with 11 queer or gender queer um, participants, and I asked them a series of questions. We did some experimentation, and that publication ended up getting me to graduate school. In my doctorate, I have very much continued this line of research, beginning with Spanish and now working outward towards other languages to take the theoretical question of gender seriously. So I'm going to have a chance to tell you exactly what my theoretical intervention is, but I'd also like to focus on the resources today. Another note about the project is that I use it to mentor undergraduate researchers at the University of California, Berkeley. I believe this is my sixth semester uh, working with students. I've had about 20 of them under my belt. 
I really, really love my students. Most of them are queer or gender non-conforming. I know this not because I ask them, but because they tell me and we have a, a, an affinity about doing this kind of research. And they are so fantastic. Um, since we have begun, I have been able to communicate. We have been able to communicate knowledge produced by the project. For instance, in academic publications, these are all my own. So I'm going to offer you a little folder of resources, some papers, some classroom resources, other things that I was able to throw together for today. At the end, I will drop that in the chat. This first paper right here I wrote in two languages. This gives a brief history of gender inclusive Spanish, as well as a picture of what's going on today and how we got there. This uh, publication on the right is entitled The Definitional Dilemma of Gender in Language, and this is the best representation of where I'm headed for my dissertation and where my mind is at. So we basically deal with the broken theory of gender in linguistics, which I will describe later, but I'm trying to clean up by us researching all of these languages and from the ground up building a picture of gender in language cross-linguistically. We have also been able to communicate knowledge produced by the project in conference venues, most recently last year um, at the Lavender Languages and Linguistics Conference in Catania, Italy, which was awesome. We got to go there, and actually me and several of my students went there physically, which was such a proud moment, and we presented this panel of four papers. There were also two individual projects. Uh, this year, we are hoping to show up at the University College London Conference if they accept us and, and uh, introduce our work on Indigenous languages and languages with verbal gender. So this has been a huge point of pride for me uh, as I struggle in my graduate career to sort of uplift people the same way that I had hoped somebody would help me enter the research world. These are some of my children. I'm not going to speak about this too much because I'll get emotional, but you can see they've moved on from me and they're doing so well. They've done better for themselves than I have for myself. The ones with question marks right here are in the very exciting phase now of having multiple offers to either masters or PhD programs and having to choose. I'm so proud of all of them. Irene is one of my absolute, absolute dearest students, and you can see the amazing work that uh, she is doing at Stanford. Now I'm so proud of her. All right, so here are the goals of the project as you sort of take a look at it in the background or listen to me. Um, and they are to provide a set of empirical language documents describing the realization of gender, so the traditional masculines and feminines, any neutral options, and of course, any inclusive uh, options that are going on throughout the grammar and lexicon of the world's languages, as many as I can research in my capacity <laughs> with my students. And also to provide pedagogical materials meant for use in community, so in queer community, right? This is very much a non-binary person or a gender non-conforming person wanting to simply know what's going on in different languages for use in community education. So sometimes I go out and give workshops at different community centers in Spanish language with reference to the English language or whatever it may be, and also resources for the language classroom. So this latter initiative is one that I need your help with, and I'm going to discuss how far I've gotten and where I can go from here with the community's help. All right, the academic goals of this research are to legitimize the many ways that queer and genderqueer people are redoing linguistic worlds. Ding! In order to express their unique gender identities, the ding here is for Chris Nisley. I actually have a chapter in this volume that I'm so proud of to share with you all about Spanish. And the other academic goal is to fix this very, very broken theory of gender in language. So basically, linguistic gender, as it is written in formal morphosyntactic theory, is described as a feature of language pertaining to a language with a particular shape. So for instance, because English does not have every single noun fall into masculine or feminine categories, we could identify a subset for sure, but not every noun. According to the theory, it is disqualified as a language that has gender. Now, this is very poor, and this obviously does not take into account the reality that we have in community, whereby we have many genders in the world and many ways to gender and to language. So that is sort of my dissertation crusade. Now that I passed my quals, I will orient myself more towards that. All right, so I'm going to take the example of Italian. These are some very recent materials that we made last semester and basically explain how we get them, how we make them. So we use here on the left traditional prescriptive resources like Routledge grammars, like Language Academy resources. I think it's so funny to use Language Academy resources because we're essentially subverting the understandings contained within them. So obviously they are relevant materials and we try to gain a picture of the traditional masculines and feminines in language and where they exist throughout the grammar. It also helps us give a shape of the language by sort of looking at how these categories are commonly described, which as it would not come as a surprise, are nouns, adjectives, articles for most Western languages. 
Now here on the right are an example of some of the sources that we take a look at to understand all of the inclusive things that are going on. These are sources that are not usually considered empirical by researchers like myself. However, in tweets, in social, other social media, blogs, wikis, is where the community is proposing things, where they are attesting things, where they are offering their sort of experiences for us. And that is where we gather our information. So right here, I have a tweet. Uh, this is Tutte, the schwa form in Italian, right, is being shown here in a tweet. We take data from tweets and analyze all the attestations that we have to extrapolate patterns to be able to write our documents. Um, Drag Race Italia, which was a burgeoning program at the time, now is in its second or third season, is using uh, the schwa in its promotional materials. And so we pulled that data as well, as well as all other we could find. Um, this is very cool, this book right here. So actually, the day after we presented our conference, uh, our panel at the conference in Catania, Italy, on Sicily, um, I went into a bookstore and pulled this book off the wall just based on its title and happened to open right to the page. Uh, by the way, this book is called Questioni di un certo genere, and I opened to this page called Cos'è quale rovesciata? So what is this upside down E? And then flip to the next page and you get actually a partial grammar that they have written about this schwa and how they are using it in just a few categories. It was just a smattering of examples that they gave us. But we pull that data too and try and conglomerate and um, synthesize patterns we find in that data, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is the oldest source that we found. So this is someone called Luca Boschetti who made this project called Italiano Inclusivo. And it's been around for quite a while. And on the webpage, which I'll show you now, if you scroll down, you get another partial grammar. This one actually installs two strategies. So we have a schwa and we have a schwa lunga or a long schwa, which they propose. And we are trying to essentially pull apart all these pieces to create a picture of the language as a whole. So with all of this data, for example, this is another book written by a linguist. However, we still have the data sort of fragmented. I've highlighted it here for you. We pull it, we try and extrapolate patterns that are going on in it. For instance, canonical morphology versus how non-canonical morphology is dealt with, et cetera, et cetera, to create a resource. So this is the final resource that is on our website right now. And we can see right here that we are in the singular describing the schwa gender. And also in the plural, where we got two different attestations for this schwa strategy, we are showing both with full references below for people to sort of view a picture of how this schwa gender would appear throughout the entire language. We don't simply invent things. So for instance, if we are able as linguists to extrapolate a pattern or to read that a pattern has been proposed, we use that. But you'll see that there are some blanks here. So for instance, the possesses miei and mie, we actually have not seen somebody neutralize those for us or have an example of those things. So in a way, it's kind of funny. It's like language planning. I sort of leave this on the internet and it signals to the community hey, could you think about this for us? And then later we report what people come up with. Now, pedagogical resources are sort of my second priority at the moment, which I don't wish it to be, but there are so few, there are actually, I would say, no real resources that you can go to for any one of these languages that describe gender within them with specificity, which would be good to know even outside of the world of queerness, right? So how do I refer to women and men? normatively in an appropriate way, you don't find those resources. So our first level priority as linguists is to write the documents. And now I am very, very invested, especially as a teacher, in hosting and creating pedagogical resources for all of these languages. So here are some of our homegrown ones. This is for Spanish. This is a paragraph with lots of gender within it, highlighted in blue. And you can actually use this drop down menu to see how this same paragraph would transform into different genders. So this is the agender with a key pronoun. And below, you can see that I've also, and we've written some some content for the ben, languages that are on. But about a minute and a half left, two minutes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. I'm going to skip this just to say one thing that I want to offer to you all is this handout that I've made, how I adapt these materials for use in the classroom. So these are some of the harder things to figure out in Spanish. We have words like hombre y mujer, so men and women, that are not simply differing by suffixal endings, but they're different at the root. So in the classroom, I really like to present, especially the college classroom, these challenges to students and say, what do you think we should do? And actually their answers would surprise you. So if you look especially at these numbers below, if you look in and squint, I'm sorry, they're small, you can see that they know about things like the A strategy. And then for the things that are harder, like these nouns with less obvious answers, they are coming up with such cool things like hadre, comhadre, mujer, omper, nuerne, all these sorts of forms that are 
ex explaining to them that they have the ability to play with language. No one controls language. They choose how to use it and they can help us sort of identify people appropriately and treat everyone with respect in the classroom and outside. So the next sort of step that I have, especially now that I have more time, <laughs> is that I'm trying to gather all the pedagogical resources that I can for these languages, even ones that we don't have documents for. I'd like to just keep them there. So as I scour, um, I might be reaching out to some of all of you to say, hey, can we link this? This is a really amazing resource. Or if you have a place to host it, we'd be so happy to host it with lots of respect and proper reference towards you. And to that end, I'm going to leave you here some information and in the chat some of my information for you all, including a Google Drive folder with just a few things that I was able to pull for you all to have today, including those handouts. This handout is available in English and in French. We have a version of, and I've thrown in some slides that I use in the classroom. Sorry, I don't have time to discuss those today, and some of the papers that I've written that should be good background for you. I wanted to say lastly that it is a total privilege to be here with people that have been teaching for much longer than me. I really, really appreciate the efforts that you all make to to incorporate understandings that seem new. They are not, but you've been doing this for years, decades, and we have so much to thank you for in incorporating these realities into your classroom. So thank you all so much, and I'm so happy to answer any questions that you may have. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Liana, Mercedes, then Goretti, please, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Carolina. Okay, Gorete, I think we're ready for you to start. Okay, perfect. So uh, do you want to do the title slide or do you want me to do it or do you want to skip? Mercedes will be doing the slides. Okay, but the title slide. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. So thank you. So um, we will be talking to you today about Sin Fronteras, which is a grammar book that includes uh, direct non-binary language. And um, obviously I am here with my two colleagues, Dr. Leana Stepanian, who you have seen a bunch today already, and uh, Mercedes Pajos Agudo. So thank you for being here at the very last, uh, or almost uh, the last of, uh, of our talks. Next slide, thank you. So just to provide you with a bit of an outline, we will be talking to you today about uh, why we use non direct non-binary uh, Spanish and how to use direct non-binary Spanish. And then we'll uh, switch it over to best practices uh, and we'll refer you to a number of resources amongst other things that oerspanish.org. Uh, as far as why to use direct non-binary language uh, in our classrooms, well, I mean, I think primarily the, the first and, and most um, obvious reason is that 11% uh, that we know of, um, of LGBTQ adults in the US alone, uh, so approximately 1.2 1, 1. million people identify as non-binary. Uh, and this is according to a study uh, by the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law. Um, and so these people need to be represented uh, somehow. I think that's a, a pretty um, obvious point to be made. But uh, in addition to that, we do see a movement already in several countries across the world to sort of begin including these. And so um, uh, when one asks the question as to why you should include it or not in your classroom, you should be representing what is happening outside. And we already have that, for example, in June 2021 in Argentina, we have ID cards already reflecting the fact that there's no binarism out there. Or in December 2022, which is very recently, there are laws that are approving uh, trans um, gender self-determination or other trans-related uh, rights, which again, point to the fact that this is happening in our society and therefore you know, should be somewhat reflected in what we do in our, in our classroom if we wanna be representative of the language that we're teaching. Um, we do see these uh, both in the world at large, but also in our more immediate reality. So for example, here at the University of Southern California and other universities, we do begin to see an increasing adoption of non-binary language 
And then, so for example, uh, we see that even evolving. So uh, in March, 2023, we saw the USC Latinx uh, being changed to Latina Student Assembly. So we do see that flowing shift happening. Um, uh, it is very much a movement in flux. And again, um, we should probably reflect as much in our classrooms because it is actually happening. Sorry, I unmute myself. And it's not only what's happening around us, right? It's what's happening directly in us, our classrooms, what we can see as instructors. So we do have uh, students in our Spanish classes that use or mention that they have preferred pronouns. And we do have direct questions with students that are like, you know, this has happened to me. How do I address it in Spanish? And this is an email that was sent to me in Spanish too, we have a portfolio where we send to students out, you know, living in LA, you have so many people around you that speak Spanish. So we send them out to the community to interview uh, people about the culinary preferences, you know, um, Spanish speaking people. Um, and then they have to report back to us. So in this case, there's an email of a student. It was like, you know, I interviewed someone that identified as they non-binary. And now I have to report about this person in the person in Spanish, and I don't know how to. And they're, as Ben was saying, they come up with their own ideas, right? Their, their students are much more resourceful than we believe they are. And so for us, it's clear that there is a need, that it's out there, but it's also present in our classrooms. And that once we faced this, there was no doubt that something needed to be done in, in our department. Okay, now that you move to the next one. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, on. Sorry, you. No? Did I skip one? Mm -hmm. So with all this being said, we've now been working on a grammar guide that we titled Sin, Fro Sin Fronteras to provide additional tools for Spanish to be taught, discussed, and learned in a more comprehensive and inclusive way and in spite of the opposition of conservative politicians, linguists and institutions that Real Academia Española that has been mentioned several times today to normalize the use of uh, direct non-binary Spanish, it appears that the use of a as a non-binary morphological form and a yeah, as a non-binary pronoun um, is the one to have persisted in both oral and written languages in Latin America, Spain and Spanish speaking communities in the United States. So after having examined the existing literature on the topic and on the experiences of Spanish language instructions and the members of the non-binary communities in Spain, Latin America, and the United States, we propose adopting A as a gender neutral pronoun and A as a non-binary morphological form in our classrooms. And beyond the multiple reasons discussed in today's conference, um, already widely used these forms resolve many linguistic issues among others due to their phonologic and morphosyntactic effectiveness. For example, you can easily say le chige instead of la chica o el chico. That of course is one of the many reasons the rest of the panels have discussed the other reasons of including non-binary language in the classroom. And while we understand that the languages continue to evolve, we hope that this book will provide learners with a snapshot of the very actively evolving path that Spanish among other languages um, is on at the time of publication. And um, as a side note, in the same vein, Sin Fronteras, um, which is conceived as a reference volume to present a more comprehensive overview of Spanish grammar, um, features voceo, the use of voz as a second person singular pronoun and the verbal forms associated with it. Um, although today at least one, of, one third of the Spanish speaking population of Latin America uses voceo, it is not typically taught to learners of Spanish as a second language. Um, next slide, please. Um, on the structure. So in the chapters um, encompassed in Sin Fronteras, learners will find concise explanations of all major uh, structures, tenses, and moods. And for each of these linguistic elements and whatever, whenever applicable, this volume reports on the ways of using non-binary language in Voseo. And the grammar section provides um, ample opportunities to apply and practice the structures. Uh, then this uh, section is followed by a reading one um, that presents authentic text to context contextualize and expand on the linguistic phenomena 
examined in the grammar section. And here too, we include topics that pertain to various aspects of non-binary identities and the use of LOSEL. And then finally, chapter culminates with a writing assignment that calls for the learned structures to be produced at the paragraph level and allows the learner to hone their writing skills while synthesizing and also reflecting on the information presented um, in the chapter. Next slide, please. This is an example of how um, the chapters are structured, but in broader terms, by incorporating the variety of forms available to the speakers of Spanish and the multiple social meanings that these forms convey, this textbook aims to contribute to the effort to promote inclusive practices in the classroom, to encourage critical thinking, and to ultimately embrace and celebrate diversity in language instruction. Next slide, please. Well, once we have a tool to work around the second idea that we started uh, considering is how to, to introduce this, this to our students, and we came up with a list of best practices for second language instruction. Many of them, I feel, like have been uh, mentioned today already, so I kind of feel a bit reluctant to bring them up one more time, but it may be a good idea. Um, so we start by mentioning our names and pronouns, uh, preferred pronouns when introducing ourselves to our students and to our colleagues. Um, that include email signature or web uh, or you know websites, anything that we send to the to the student as a way to uh, make sure that they know that we address we use pronouns. We will invite everyone to use their preferred pronouns, and it's a way to encourage participation in that sense. Um, we um, mention I'll, I'll, I actually. I would like to do this in the examples later. Um, and we would like to give our students also ample opportunities to practice throughout the semester the knowledge or uh, the forms that Diana has been talking about before. Some examples, I think that's going to be better. Um, as I said, um, we introduced the E uh, ending for non binary forms. And we also think that it is important to be consistent that this is not just introduced once in the class and is left behind. This is not, um, you know, like those books we were doing, I don't know, Mexico chapter one, and then we move on to a different thing. This has to be reiterated. It has to be brought back. It has to be continued in discussion. And um, in the examples um, Liana was giving you previously, there are some activities where they have to talk about their classmates, about their family. And we give them an example in which we have included non-binary language, giving them a chance that if that's the case individually, if that happens to them and they feel comfortable, they can bring it up with the rest of the class. Uh, we try to also have texts um, that show what's happening, that are real documents. We're not inventing this. Uh, this is happening again in the society where we are. Um, there's a reading activity about Anatomy of the Grace, Great Anatomy, where I think it was two seasons ago for the first time, uh, there is a character, it's a non-binary character, and very much in line of what um, in the previous panel if they, were, they were saying, we uh, encourage them to be journalists and change the text to make it, you know, more inclusive or non-binary inclusive by just including those forms. Um, other examples, we also, one thing that we want to bring up or we want to mention is the fact that we are not doing this on our own, as it has been mentioned all over uh, the day. Um, the important thing is to inform yourself, to communicate, to ask people that know about this, that use the language, and find real sources where the language is being used. So in this case, this is a, actually a, a blog of our instructor um, that identifies a non-binary and all the information that um, they is using is by using the structured professore and using the E ending and giving advice to future students that want to enter the profession of the and the space programming. Again, real source. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. And lastly, we invite you to take a look at a chapter that we created for our online uh, repository that illustrates how direct non-binary Spanish can be used in context. I just dropped the link in the chat um, very briefly about that website. These resources are created by USC faculty and each chapter specifies the educational goals, grammar structures, and the level of the activities. 
This website requires no registration and materials can be downloaded, adapted, and shared. And uh, the last slide, please. This is our information. Please do contact us um, with any comments and suggestions. We welcome your feedback and your questions. And this is all on our part. Thank you. Amazing. And thank you for being on time. <laughs> Uh, that means that we will have a little bit more time for questions at the end. Um, and Eduardo, whenever um, you're ready, we're ready for you. Thank you for having me here. I'm learning a lot of your presentations as well. Um, I will talk about a textbook that I, I have been working on since 2019. And like some of you have mentioned, has mentioned before, this is a work in progress in the sense that I've been learning with my students, with non-binary students, I've been learning from colleagues, and I've been incorporating non-binary language in the textbook as I've learned about it. Um, let me go to the view. So the textbook is available online. It's an open educational resource called Bachipapu. Um, I use the he pronoun, but I don't mind which pronoun people use with me in the classroom. That's what I tell students. You can call me, use Eli, Ella, or Elis, Ellas, or Elo. So the background, as I mentioned, the textbook started in 2019. It's available through the uh, Pressbook platform, and it's a CC BY material. So anyone can copy, modify, use it as they wish. Um, press books is with the University of Washington, but other institutions also have it. Uh, the outcomes of the textbook in the beginning, when I created in 2019, uh, I was thinking of incorporating everyday Portuguese language, be inclusive in the representation of gender identifications, race, LGBTQI people, um, and follow a bottom-up approach in the sense that I was basing the chapters on dialogues that were unhearsed and recorded in Brazil. So here's one way that we are representing people with people of color, with transgender people, as the case of Gisberta, Salsi Jr., uh, people from African countries as well. Um, also in the iconography, in the images, right, of throughout the book. And in 2019, the way that I was thinking of being inclusive was by putting Ella, the she, before he. So everything in the textbook had in the conjugation tables, Ella and Eli, right? So she, he. And then finally in 2022, it took me three years, I decided that that was not enough. And I went to a conference last year and I saw the conversation about being using non-binary language being very heated among my colleagues. And when I came back home, I decided that I would definitely put the non-binary uh, ELU that's being mostly used now in the Portuguese speaking world. So I keep the textbook of she, he, and then they, non-binary. So ela, ele, elu. Uh, I added an explanation note in the e-text in 2022, explaining that we have elu and ili, among other pronouns, but elu is the non-binary pronoun that's currently preferred or mostly used. Um, and I put that note in the textbook in the beginning. Then on the syllabus, um, I consulted with another colleague that also used non-binary language. and I put in a note about gender inclusion in the Portuguese language and the notes here. So it's inviting students to um, use the pronouns that some of you have said, but they don't, if they feel comfortable doing, they don't have to. So, so that was the, the idea. Um, and I also offer my pronouns as well. Then here's a conjugation table. So you have eu, tu, ela, ele, elo, você, tem. 
a gente, it's like we folks in Brazil, and we use that very often, more than us. So that was already in the first version, 2019. And then elas, eles, elos, vocês. Um, with some of the pronouns, possessive pronouns, and, and they, they can be quite complicated in Portuguese because you have, uh, we mark gender as well. So here I decided to do a little bit of scaffolding and start introducing them little by little in the textbook. Uh, so you have meu carro for my car, minha casa for my house, minha amiga for my friend, right? And then an explanation of the non-binary finishing with the letter E. And that was also a, a process to me because before I was using X in 2019. So when I had the, uh, here's a table with um, adjectives for, you know, describing people and I had X on everything. So I'd write sympathetic and X. And then of course, with time, I understood that Oh, I knew before that we couldn't pronounce. Um, it was kind of a take on the Latin X. And then the E, simpatici, it's very pronounceable. Uh, it's, it sounds like a romance language to me. Um, and, and it works really well. So I don't see why people would be so much against it other than for you know, prejudice and, and not cognitively not being uh, open to to try to learn this new variant, right? Uh, so that's something I changed in 2022. I took all the X's out and put E's uh, instead. So here you have Faladori, Chieti, Tranquilli. The ones that don't have the E is because they accept all gender uh, identifications like Legal, Bacana. And then on the instructions, I started changing them, like here, escute sua professora, seu professor, sui professori, falar sobre como ela, ele, elo está, e circule as palavras que ela, ele, elo diz. I'm just trying to find a way of making it less, with less slashes and, you know, like a little bit easier to read, and, and it has been a process to me. Um, so I don't think I have the example here. Oh, here is an example. Uh, converse com várias pessoas. In, na sala, encontre uma pessoa com um final de semana similar ao seu. So using the palavra pessoa for directions, it seems to be a little bit more streamlined for me. And I'm working on, with that on the textbook. Because before I had uma colega, um colega, um colega, like a classmate. And um, I found it hard to read the text. Uh, I, I understand that for people that are, have dyslexia, it can be quite difficult to read texts like this with lots of, um, you know, the lashes, the bars right on the side. And also the axes, that's something I, I learned later on that it was very, very difficult for people with dyslexia to read text with axes all over the, um, the board. I think I'm doing okay with time, I'm almost finished. Um, so the takeaway and conclusions that I, I have is that the use of non-binary inclusive language in the e-textbook has been an ongoing project, as I mentioned uh, several times. I have learned and I'm still learning uh, the inclusive language developed by Portuguese speaking communities, especially by LGBTQI communities. Um, I also understand the impact of having that in a textbook format because it is in every chapter, just like Sin Fronteras, it's not just a note, right? So I understand the impact of students in class. They are using it. They're using the language. They're using ELOs, ELO, no problem. This has been... Um, a learning process with some mistakes from my part and adjustments, as I mentioned, the X or um, the directions in the textbook that sometimes they might not they feel a little convoluted. Um, in my experience, most non-binary 
in my experience, non-binary and most students in general appreciate the efforts in being inclusive in our language usage. Um, they want that. I think that's where uh, things are heading to. I want to be in the right side of history. Um, and even being an LGBTQ person myself, um, that doesn't mean I know how to use non-binary language, right? So it is a learning process. And I find that sometimes it's even harder for people that have been speaking the language for a long time. While for students that are just learning, I just tell them that's how it is, this ending, and they can pick it up faster. I find myself sometimes having to retrain my brain a, a lot. Um, but it has been easier than what I thought it would be, actually, with Portuguese. And special thank you to the non-binary students that I had over the years uh, for their patience and willingness to teach me. Uh, it has been a work, a real teamwork on that sense. And here's my contact. Um, I can put the chat for on the chat, the textbook information. It's here, so you can take a look on the textbook. And that's it for my part. And I think it gives us some time for questions and a conversation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. And thank you, Ben, Liana, Mercedes, Goretti. Um, there has been a few questions on the uh, chat. Some of them uh, Ben has answered already because he's that magical uh, and so capable. Um, but uh, Ben, if you don't mind, I'm going to bring those back just in case people were not paying attention to the chat. Um, cool. Yeah, great. Um, so there was somebody that says, given that you have included Spanish and Catalan, right, in uh, your project, you might want to explore including other minority peninsular languages like Gallego and Carolina, you're breaking up. That's all good. I can try to finish the other half of the question as, as she gets back online. So I remember the question was about Gallego, Euskera, Basque, um, some of these regional languages of Spain. Um, we have very much a desire to do as many languages as we can. And actually, I know that things are being done in Basque, and I know that things are being done in Gallego. Um, and my colleague Artemis Lopez is working on this very actively. It's just sort of a matter of time um, and the ability of us to do the work. But I do have someone on my team that wants to work on Basque. I always am super happy to accept contributions and help from all sorts of other people. And if any of you would like to see something on this very mutual resource that we share, I'm so happy to figure out how to install it there. Um, thanks, Carolina. I just finished the other half of the question so that we could answer it. Thank you so much. And and sorry, because of course the computer has to shut down just at the moment where like yeah. I'm gonna ask the questions. I've been here all day since 9 a.m. <laughs> um and then there was um one more person inquiring about French. Why not French? Yeah, French is one <laughs> language, you know. I feel like in my training I get Italian, I get Spanish, I get Portuguese. French is actually the most morphologically complex of all the romance languages and so it's because it wasn't one that I began to research or I I forgot my 2 years of high school French and I have problems putting it back together. I have a colleague at UC Berkeley actually Jennifer Kaplan, if I can find it quickly enough, I will paste the article that she wrote that is so brilliant that actually goes through all the morphological complexity of French and the new things that are being done to be inclusive of other identities. And now it's just a matter of time that I can sit down with her and we can make the grammar, but that is in progress. And I thank you so much. In this folder that I shared earlier, there's a little resource for the French classroom. And um, that's all I've got right now. I'm sorry. I'm so happy to accept contributions as per the last question. And we are looking forward to French. If I may add to that, Chris Nisley works with... Chris uh, Nisley, absolutely. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Um, read his articles. We've been working off of Chris's and Ben's articles for a few years now. So very interesting and very informative for different languages, including French. Chris is fantastic. Thank you. Um, Liana Mercedes and Goretti, there is so much excitement in the audience about your textbook. Uh, people are asking about when is it going to be published, uh, if it will be free access. Um, so any sneak peek that you guys can give us about it? 
the book has been completed. We are thinking about, we're working with a publisher on figuring out how to make it available. Ideally, it will be an open educational resource type of publication or both. That's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Eduardo, I have a question for you that somebody posted in the in the uh, chat and he said, is this newer version of Bate Papo available? And have you considered also using inclusive language for the English translations? Thank you. Thanks for the question. I just answered. I think it was then easy, right? Um, so it is a, it is available online on that link that I put in the chat. Uh, so every time I go and change something, it's already available there. What doesn't make available right away is the downloadable version of the textbook, because then I have to make sure that I download every time I make changes, and I make changes almost every week. But over the summer, I'm gonna review all the directions, and then easy suggested using they. Uh, I think that's a great idea instead of putting, uh, you know, the she he they everywhere so um i think that's great thank you denise for for the suggestion um i think i had that maybe in a few directions but not in many i actually i have a question uh for all of you um you have been talking about um your students how grateful they are the students that are in your classes the students that are working for you that are your mentoring I'm curious about your colleagues. Um, when your colleagues hear that you are working on this, um, what is their reaction? Are, is, are people curious? We all know that the ones that we are here, we are definitely curious and interested and supportive. Um, but I want to know, um, you know, how are things uh, within your own departments and universities and what you have been seeing in your own departments regarding this? Maybe I can kick that one off because I've had a more difficult experience, actually. So when I the reason that I, I tried to break out of teaching language, even though I love it and I think it is so valuable, is because we had a language coordinator that was kind of hostile. To a lot of things and this was one of them um and it was you know how a question of you know the rules how do we grade and i say well i'm not going to police their gender but i can grade on agreement things like that and so the way that i deal with it is sort of by subverting the system and and giving the open ears and the teachers that were open to teaching this material the resources and the power to do so kind of in an underground way i find that that's a, a sadder situation i'm actually trying to install a policy university-wide that would sort of eliminate things like that um, but it can be done. It can be done even in underground networks. Goretti, would you like to answer that question for our department? Yes. I mean, well, you can tell me if I'm doing a good job of representing because um, I think language departments tend to be, uh, Ben, I'm sorry for your experience because not always clearly, but they they do tend to be sort of like a, like a, an area or an arena where we may find some receptiveness to this, right? Not everyone is going to be immediately on board, but generally we do tend to see that people are in tune with what's being done out there. People are um, have a certain type of openness, perhaps, to those, those things, or so we hope. I think here at USC, we're finding that, but I think we, we also... Um, are 100% aware that change and particularly change of this nature comes slowly. And so while it is super, super, super frustrating sometimes how um, U-shaped that is, not only how slow, but how U-shaped, right? How many times you have to take a step forward and then wonder whether you just took one back, will you go forward again? Frustrating as that is, you have to realize that that's how change happens in all, in all levels whether you're changing anything, almost like anything other than your socks, change comes slowly and it's messy. And so you take it with that kind of patience, right? You try, it helps to have people around you that have that kind of same mentality that are not gonna give up on trying to do something just because there's a setback or because it is not immediately embraced and adopted. So you just, you're in it from the, for the long haul. I think, uh, by and large, we're finding a positive attitude. And I think by and large, we're seeing that our university is sort of like taking steps that are 
mirroring what we're doing ourselves. It may not be linear, but I think it, we would be um, sort of, I would be remiss to say that there's there's no steadfast, steadfast progress in this in this front. I mean, if, Liana, what do you think though? Because I think you'd be better equipped to answer that question. You know, I would also write, uh, like to read another question here. So how do you combat hostility, right, um, among your colleagues? Slowly and patiently would be my answer. We receive, you know, all sorts of comments. Mostly people are supportive, surprisingly, I might add, um, in Spanish. But sometimes we receive comments such as, uh, what do you care? That's not even your language. I'm not a non-native, right, speaker of Spanish. or um, you know, la Real Academia Española manda esto y lo otro, right? So we receive all sorts of comments and how do we address them? We organize, we collaborate with people who do show support for our projects and for our um, initiatives. And that's that's how we do it. And also, ultimately, it's it's about the people around us, right? And we, every semester, get students who talk to us about feeling included in the classroom. And even, there's another question in, in the chat, even if the next uh, professor is close-minded, the student had an experience with us that motivates many times, like I don't remember one of our presenters mentioned this, uh, motivates us to continue to discuss this in, at conferences, to bring it up in class. And we do this regularly in our classrooms. Many still don't do this regularly in the classroom. I'm talking about using non-binary language. Uh, we do. We've been working uh, on this for years now. So from day one, we use non-binary class uh, language in the classroom. Other professors are just, just learning. We're also just learning. I like um, Eduardo's um, comments on how we make mistakes constantly, right? We make mistakes every single time. We correct ourselves and we, you know, go on and we learn and there's more and more research available. We incorporate that in our class and um, that's how we address it. So Chris is, um, Chris, you're here, right? Okay, would you like to join this conversation on combating hostility and addressing people um, in our departments who are against, I don't want to say innovating, changing, I'm going to say incorporating this form of teaching. Yeah, sure. I, I'll start by saying um, I have resources that I actually made in, in starting to think about responding to students' comments, but I found <laughs> that the same sort of way that I approach students tend to, to work with the faculty who show some resistance, um, but who are not um, actively transphobic and, and, and close to a discussion. I, I think you have to sort of triage your efforts and recognize when there is nothing you could possibly say uh, to get a person on board, because uh, un unfortunately we live in a wildly transphobic world, and um, there are some people who it doesn't matter the argument you make. But um, for those who who are a bit more open, I try to appeal to the things that they're already aware of. They're already aware of that language is changing, and I talk oftentimes. I'll talk about like. In the, in the case of French, well, do you, do you teach this as an ordi phone, as a computer phone? Because that's what the Académie Française would tell us we have to call it. And yet I have never, out in the world, languaging with people, heard it called an ordi phone. It's an, an iPhone, uh, a smartphone, etc. And so I try to help them understand that that this is another part of linguistic variation, and it's not something that is unique. Like, in many ways, it is unique, but not in terms of language change, right? And, and so I try to appeal to, to that awareness. And then I also try to show them the, the various research that's out there that shows that our students are interested. This is beneficial to them far beyond the practices 
of the actual language forms and structures. It helps them think differently about language and about languaging with one another. Um, and then I also sort of just put out there that, you know, as language programs and departments, we have a choice. We evolve and we adapt and we stay relevant and we address the needs and interests of our students or we fail to do that and we prefigure our own demise. Um, and so I, I think there are a lot of different angles to go at it. And I think the best way to decide how to go at it is to think about who are you speaking with or who are you engaged in this conversation with and what is the source of their resistance and, and leaning into your relationship with that person to think about what are they stuck on and, and how can you unstick them? And I'll stop talking there and I will put in the chat a couple of links to those resources I mentioned real quick. Yeah, and, and Eduardo, I would like to close up um, our panel by um, having you share what your experience has been at, at the University of, of Washington in Seattle, please. Yeah, for me, it's having an emotional connection. So, you know, I see a student who is non-binary, as Liana was mentioning. They are in class with me every day. They happen to be a lot of the times the best students ever and the most dedicated, the most patient, the most polite people um, that deal with so much adversities in their lives. And I just want to show them respect. So I would tell, you know, my colleagues, well, maybe, you know, pay attention to your non-binary students and it benefits all of us. It's about social justice. It's not just about non-binary people. It's about women's rights. It's about LGBTQ about men's there there's so much in the spectrum spectrum of masculinity who you can be in the world so it's about all of us uh, i agree with all the comments what chris said as well there are people you can't really come to an agreement because there is no agreement ever so you know when that's the case i'm not gonna hit my head against the wall <laughs> i'll just accept them uh, as they are and continue with my work Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all, all panelists and attendees. Liana, I believe um, you want to say some final remarks on the uh, conference. So, yes, thank you. We have successfully reached the end of our programming. And one more time, all sessions have been recorded. We'll be sharing them together with all the resources that we received from the presenters and the attendees. And to sum up, the main, one of the main goals today was to bring together everybody, researchers, practitioners, members of the LGBTQI plus communities, educators, students. I think we have successfully accomplished that. And I hope you found the presentations and the discussions both informative and stimulating. And uh, please do stay in touch so we can continue this conversation on the matters of gender inclusive language instruction and beyond. And thank you all for joining today. Thank you, um, dear panelists. Thank you attendees for your wonderful questions, for your positive, very positive feedback and for your support. And we hope to see you next time. I'm sure there will be many more conferences that um, address gender inclusive language instruction. Thank you very much till the next time.